The northeastern U.S. has some pretty variable weather patterns. It's often quipped that if you don't like the current weather, just wait 10 minutes. In this segment, we'll learn about our region's broad climate patterns, the difference between climate and weather, and the factors that influence the local microclimate that directly impacts plants every day and defines where they can live. The term climate refers to the average weather conditions, such as temperature, precipitation amounts, and number of frost-free days, measured over an extended period of years. In the U.S., it's the National Climate Data Center that accumulates these data over spans of decades, going back to the first systematic record collections from the late 1800s. Climate data give us a long-term perspective that enables us to see how our current climate patterns compare with the running average over a much longer time scale. For example, this global map highlighting New England and surrounding states in the black circle displays how the average temperature in the year 2015 compared to the average temperatures measured across more than 120 years of record keeping. Areas shaded with hot colors, ranging from golden to orange to red, were significantly warmer in 2015 relative to the longer record. Notice that our region falls in a warm orange zone. Indeed, even with the brutal cold winter of 2015, that year was the warmest year to date on record, both in the U.S. and worldwide. This image of heavy snowfall will bring back memories of dreaded weather forecasts of one unrelenting blizzard after another. Makes me shiver just recalling it. But it highlights that weather is, in fact, a short-term phenomenon. That's why there's a National Weather Service, your tax dollars at work, that's distinct from the National Climate Data Center. The National Weather Service focuses on short-term forecasts spanning small geographic areas. Will it rain today in my hometown of Amherst, Mass? And how cold will it be? Plants adapt to weather in the short term by all sorts of plastic responses, much as we don an umbrella during a rainstorm. Some unusual plants actually buck the weather, such as this early spring snowstorm. The eastern skunk cabbage, Simplicarpus fetidus, can melt the snow surrounding its blooming flower because it uses a unique chemical respiratory pathway that emits heat, as well as the stinky smell that attracts flies to pollinate it. Climate exerts a big influence on the large-scale biogeographic range of plants. We saw earlier that plants quickly expanded their ranges once the cold climates associated with glaciation became warmer. But eventually, every plant species will reach a boundary that is at least in part determined by its maximum and minimum temperature tolerances. Mangroves, for example, which are trees that inhabit tropical and subtropical coastlines and currently are found in Florida and Hawaii, will probably never make it significantly farther north than Georgia because frost events still happen there on a regular basis. And some boreal plants, such as Diapensia laponica, aptly named the pincushion plant, aren't necessarily able to expand below their very cold, high latitudes because they can't tolerate long strings of warm and hot temperatures that dry them out and disrupt their mutualisms with pollinators. In contrast, some boreal species of the Northeast have more interesting distributions. Minuardia greenlandica, or Greenland stitchwort, is found at our highest elevations on Mount Mansfield in Vermont, the Adirondacks of New York, the White Mountains, and Mount Katahdin in Maine. But it also inhabits high elevations of the Appalachian Mountains, much further south. These high elevations afford it the alpine conditions in which it thrives. Plus, it was probably pushed further south by glaciation into the Appalachians, while keeping a tenuous foothold on the mountain summits in the northeast that poked above the glaciers, so-called nunataks, from the Inuit word for isolated peak. The northeastern U.S. lies at a nexus of climates, 
and thus it's also a meeting point where plants from farther south in the Appalachians and the coastal plain meet more boreal plants that are common in the high latitudes and the subarctic. Thus, the 3,500 species of plants in New England are a diverse mixture of warm adapted and cold adapted taxa. The interior of the northern states, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, and Maine, are cold with long winters, short summers, and fewer frost-free days than other climates in the region. Alpine plants, bog plants, and trees that dominate the so-called taiga of Canada, such as black spruce and other conifers, abound here. The central portions of the region tend to experience an intermediate number of frost-free days and are characterized by longer summers in which a few days exceed 90 degrees Fahrenheit in temperatures. Southern areas of Cape Cod, the islands, Long Island, and portions of Connecticut have more affinity with the climates and plant communities of the mid-Atlantic coastal plain in New Jersey and Maryland, with the least snow, hotter summers with several 90-degree days, and a majority of frost-free days during the year. So what does all this climate information mean for plants? Well, any of you who is a gardener may pay attention to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Hardiness Zone Map and know that it was updated in 2012 to reflect warming temperatures across the U.S. This map lets you know which plants will thrive where, based upon horticultural research that determines the species' maximum cold tolerances. Here's the slice for the Northeast, which ranges from Zone 3 to Zone 7. Although plants respond uh, and evolve in the long term to climate trends, it's important to recognize that in the short term, plants also respond to and influence their microclimates. What do we mean by microclimate? A microclimate is a local atmospheric zone where the climate differs from the surrounding area. The term can refer to areas as small as a few square meters, for example, a garden bed, or as large as many square kilometers or square miles. As an example, these cliffs in Vermont differ in temperature from their base to their summit, but they also have colder pockets where the cliffs shade the ground beneath them. You can also see from the dark streaks coursing down their curves that rain falling on the summit accumulates as it flows over them to lower elevations. Trees have established in the level areas interspersed among the steep bare outcrops where moisture accumulates. So it's the small-scale climate that determines where individual plants can recruit and survive. Let's explore microclimate in more detail. Topography, that is the shape and elevation of the landscape, is important to plants. We mostly think that higher altitudes are colder, and indeed they are, because the annual mean temperature tends to decrease by 5 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet of elevation. Indeed, summits also tend to be drier as well as cooler than lower elevations because water flows off smooth summits with shallow soils. But cold air also tends to sink because it is more dense, hence heavier, than warm air. So valleys and small hollows tucked into other areas are places where cold air pools. We talked about talus or toe slopes that have been created by ice plucking that deposit skirts of jumbled rocks at the bottom of hillsides. Cool air settles into the interstices between the rocks. Often, talus will hold ice long into the spring season and release cold meltwaters well into summer. Ledges below talus are flatter and hold water that has flowed off the summit or seeped out of talus. Sometimes that water is enriched in nutrients that it's leached from the rocks it has passed through. Thus, trees on these ledges can sometimes grow to prodigious sizes. Most lush of all, of course, are valleys, which collect not only water, but build up lots of humus, organic matter, over time. 
whether shaded by cliffs or by a dense tree canopy, plants that are growing in darker conditions must be well suited to garnering what dappled sunlight they can, so light becomes part of the equation of microclimate. With their large leaves, ferns do especially well in shade. Some, like this evergreen wood fern, Dryopteris intermedia, also retain their leaves all year round to capture sunlight. So-called spring ephemerals, uh, like violets, bloodroot, Dutchman's breeches, and wild ginger shown here, Asarum canadense, also do well in shade. They're called spring ephemerals because they arise early in spring, before the canopy has leafed out. During this time, they take advantage of sunlight and nutrients and move quickly to reproduce. By the time the canopy has closed, they've largely finished their life cycle for the year. Finally, aspect, or the direction in which a slope faces, determines the amount of sunlight and hence warmth that a stand of plants will receive over the course of a year. This topographic map of Canaan Mountain in northwestern Connecticut shows steep slopes that drop off to the northeast and the southwest. Very different forest types and plant communities occupy these zones, as we'll see next. This is a map of the natural communities of Canaan Mountain, prepared by botanist Bill Moorhead. It's a complicated mosaic, to be sure, and Canaan Mountain is a hotspot of biological diversity in the state. All you have to notice, though, are the contrasting colors to the northeast and the southwest, which denote the different community types. Cool, loving plant species, dominated by eastern hemlock and birch and maple species, grow in northeast-facing sites, which receive comparatively less direct sun throughout the year. Southwest-facing slopes, on the other hand, tend to be dominated by oaks and hickories, hardwood species that hail from warmer climes. So plants are sensitive to, and also shape, their own microclimates. Plus, as we all know, they profoundly shape the greater global climate.